So with that, I'm going to turn you over to Amelie Coran, who is the moderator for the panel. I'll let her introduce the panel subject and her cohort here with you. Hey everybody, welcome to ShmooCon 2020. Great to have you all here. All right, so our panel today is on election security. Um, you know, it could be topical, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. so. Um, but we've got a great panel out here today uh, on, on my left here, actually, is uh, Kimber Dowsett, uh, Ms. Bat on Twitter, um, works for um, uh, Trust. Next is Casey John Ellis, uh, Casey John Ellis on at Twitter as well, uh, for Bug Crowd. Um, I'm trying to remember here, it's like uh, everything's moved around. Jack Cable, Jack Asia Cable, independent security researcher. And then um, uh, Todd Beardsley, TODB on Twitter at Rapid7. So, as you all know, if you're American citizens or not, you know, the election's coming up. We've got a little over eight months till the, the next election. Many years we've been finding issues with um, uh, disinformation campaigns, voting hacking, you know, all sorts of stuff that's been in the news. Today's panel here is to kind of like have an open and honest discussion about where we are, things we can actually take care of between now and then, stuff that we may actually end up having to put on the backlog to address after the uh, upcoming election, but also discuss some of the challenges that we have uh, anywhere from uh, the, the lo uh, local election uh, locations, so your cities, your towns, states levels, but also where the federal government stands in assisting uh, uh, fair and secure elections. So with that, to set the stage here, I'm going to let each one of them kind of introduce uh, kind of where they stand on the topic. And to my left here is Kimber, and I'll let her uh, do the introduction there. I didn't know that's what we were doing. Okay. We agreed at the bar. Uh, all right. So your, your position on the election security. My position yes. is the most important, clearly, because I'm going first. You know, weigh up the equities. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'll just take this opportunity to say that I fully believe that there should be partnerships between security researchers and <clears throat> voter registration systems and election systems that actually encompass a lot of different things, including voter registration. Um, but I take the stance <clears throat> that while I myself believe that transparency is the only way for a government to have the trust of its people, as security researchers, if we do re reactionary um, disclosures of vulnerabilities, we run the risk of actually harming democracy by making people think their votes don't count. Um, if, they're, if they really feel like, oh no, it's hacked, everything's broken, I, this researcher said he popped the machines at DEF CON, right? Um, my vote doesn't count anyway, and they don't go to the polls, then we as researchers have done the biggest disservice to the American people and democracy. Casey? Yeah, so I, uh, you, the accent you're hearing is from Australia. I, I can't actually vote here, so technically this is foreign interference. We're off to a good start. <laughs> technically. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now, look, my position on this, you know, Australia is a Western democracy as well. Uh, coming here and, and, and getting involved in this issue a, a few years back, um, obviously what happens in the U.S. as, like, really the, the you know, modern owner of the democratic kind of ideal in, in the Western world, I think, um, or the, the role model at the very least. You know, whatever happens here will, will trickle downstream uh, to, to other countries that are doing the same thing. So I've got a personal interest from that standpoint. Um, really, you know, my, my kind of stake in this, and it's part of, partly informed by what I do at Bug Crowd, uh, is the role of the security researcher, not just to resolve and help resolve the technical issues that exist within machines, but also within all of the other stuff. Um, but also the, uh, you know, the, the fact that we need to actually restore, I believe, some confidence in, in the American population that are, at this point, generally nervous about the Russian boogeyman um, and, and feeling like they can be hacked. They don't really know what that means, but they know it's possible. That in and of itself exposes a vulnerability for disinformation, um, which I actually think we can be a part of, of you know, helping resolve in 2020. So that's my position. Cool. And Jack? Mm -hmm. Yeah, along similar lines, I yeah, come from the perspective of a hacker who's trying to make the election system better. And it's clear that there is a lot to be improved. And yeah, part of where I'm coming from is looking at the problem as a whole rather than um, some of the, say, limited 
insight the security community has had into, say, voting machines, but really realizing that this is much, much broader than just that, and seeing where hackers can best play into that. And one key part to that is starting these vulnerability disclosure policies at both, say, state and local government levels, as well as with the election vendors. And they're coming along, and I think that that's one of the key ways that we as a community can interact with them and really work together to secure these systems rather than kind of existing in these two separate worlds. And finally, Todd. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm last, so all the good opinions are taken, I guess. Sorry. Um, no <laughs> uh, I, I work a lot with uh, vulnerability disclosure, uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure specifically. Um, you know, I care a lot about you know, that process really of like how researchers communicate their findings to vendors, to someplace like Assert, um, to DHS, um, and, and so I've been working in that area some, uh, but I have, a, I have a pretty solid IT operator uh, background, and so I care a lot about like the IT infrastructure that I get, like Jack says, is not just voting machines. <laughs> um, I actually don't care hardly at all about voting machines. I think there are good people doing great work there already. Um, you know, the there. I think that's covered, right? Like, I don't think that that's where we need to spend our, our time. Um, it would be great if they were super secure, um, but they're not, and they will get there eventually because we have we're starting to do coordinated vulnerability disclosure with uh, with the vendors. I care a lot about the IT infrastructure that is not just you know state and county and local, uh, but also campaigns. Um, I care a lot about what campaign IT security is doing. Um, it's disheartening when CISOs quit uh, and, uh, and and have fiery letters about their quitting. Um, but but yeah, and uh, and and I, I'll, I'll I think I'll end there for now. Okay. All right. Cool. So. You know, the title of the, the talk here is Hacking Democracy on Security Elections. So it's, it's a big ocean to boil. Mm. So our opening question here right now is, given the breadth and depth of talent on this panel, which is, you've now been introduced to, uh, what is the most important issue to focus on addressing before the next primary cycle, the, the fall election, and so forth, and what can actually be done both in the medium, short, and long term between now and then, and what do we basically have to focus on afterwards? Anyone want to kind of... I'll start by saying I think this may be the thing we all agree on, that it's not voting machines. It's also not voting machines. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Absolutely. My job here is done. All right. All right. Sorry. So we all agree now. it's not voting machines, so it's less of a, uh, a technical attack on this po point. However, you know, given that, you know, the election systems are vulnerable, like thinking like an attacker, what would be those things you would go after right now if it's not voting machines? Yeah, um, you know, interesting conversations around around the voting machine issue, but not with that as the thing that would actually be targeted in and of itself. Like the idea that you can buy one of these things off eBay, make it look like it's infected with WannaCry, and tweet that in the right places. Um, you know, the, the the kind of exposure that exists and, and the weakness that exists in the population around disinformation to to affect turnout or to manipulate turnout. That's one example. I, I think. Um, even things like election night security feeds, uh, sorry, um, information feeds, data feeds uh, between, you know, the uh, the election officials and the media, uh, manipulating that so to you know make people feel like they've won, like convincingly before they go out and vote, and maybe they don't do that, so you can ma manipulate the outcome in that way. I think there's just a lot of different ways to monkey with this stuff, and and the way that the communities tended to think about it is direct manipulation of of records. Um, that's a pretty expensive attack. Like, if I'm a bad guy that's wanting to do something in this space, that's probably not the thing that I'm going to go after first if there's all of these other things available. So I think for 2020, it's taking the heat out to some degree from under the pot with this fear that exists around interference. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, hopefully doing that in ways that can be sustained to have an actual security impact, you know, looking forward to 2024 and so on. And Jack, for some of our prep that we did beforehand, you have a little bit of the yeah. other perspective yeah. on this? So if we look at what happened in 2016 in the Russians' interference in our election, we see that they're, they're targeting three areas. They're targeting the election infrastructure itself with attacks on, say, public voter registration systems. They're targeting campaigns and um, the entities that surround those, for instance, the hack of the DNC and the subsequent leak of those documents, which 
probably had the largest impact of anything that the Russians did by leaking true information that then had a real effect on the primary. So there was that, and lastly, there were these large-scale disinformation campaigns that targeted voters generally over social media. So we can expect all of these in 2016 and likely at a much more sophisticated and much more scaled level and not just from Russia. So if we're thinking about what the most pressing threats are, I think we have to think along all three of these lines. It's hard to say if any are more important than the other. It just is how successful they can be in doing any of these. So in 2016, for instance, the attacks on the infrastructure didn't have much of an impact. They read some information, but nothing really happened. And th that's all to say that this could change in the future if they do do something that exploits a vulnerability in either voter registration system, election night reporting system, in order to actually change people's opinions. And all of this really isn't to change the outcome of an election. It's to change people's thoughts that go into the election and to change our thoughts about our democratic institutions as a whole. So it's, it's broader than just any one election. It's to weaken our confidence in these systems. And that's really what's being targeted here. Yeah, and, and I feel like 2019 at least was kind of a dress rehearsal for, for 2020 when it came to exercising municipalities backup and recovery systems. Um, there were a whole lot of, uh, there, there was a spate of ransomware attacks uh, during that, you know, during that period that continues today. Um, and, and I think that if I, you know, if I was an attacker and I wanted to disrupt an election and disrupt turnout, uh, I, would, I would make a big obvious splash with, with DDoS and encrypt all the things, um, you know, maybe a week before the election. Because like, we've, we've seen that it takes a while to get, to get, to get off the block when it comes to uh, recovering from something like that. So I would, if, if, if you are responsible <laughs> for county IT, uh, I, I think now's the time at least, to uh, exercise your backup and recovery. So as part of that, you know, it's, it's infrastructure, <laughs> it's, it's process workflow and procedures, and I know we were talking, I was getting prepped for this panel, talking about the vulnerability disclosure policy, and I know uh, we kind of, not so much a heated discussion, but a very intense discussion, and you know, Kimber, you know, uh, you had a recent meeting with some folks that could be looking at this for uh, state and local areas, and any details on that? Sure, yeah, I, I do have, uh, share a similar passion with Jack to um, see vulnerability disclosure policies here, here from henceforth referred to as VDPs, um, <clears throat> rolled out at stake and state and local levels. Um, so I face some of these challenges in the federal space as, as other feds in the room have who have worked on the VDP issue and it comes down to budgeting and resources. So um, yes, I did have the opportunity to, to talk to some state folks uh, quite recently this morning um, about this issue. And you know what? The state has the same challenge with resources and budgets. So if you think about VDPs in general, um, you, you probably most of you have seen one. Uh, they may have a reporting mechanism that's as simple as an email address, right? Um, security at schmoocon.com, we'll say. Um, and you think, well, why wouldn't they just set that up? But there has to be a person actually checking that inbox. So there you've got a resource. Okay, well, now the vulnerability comes in. How are you going to fix it? Well, hopefully you've got some sort of incident response workflow in place in, in this, at the state or local level, right? So now you've taken in this report, and now how many people have to be deployed to work on the issue that you've just rolled out? So you can see why the state and local munis municipalities are hesitant to roll out a vulnerable disclosure policy because they know it's, it's a cascading effect of all the resources and time, money, people, knowledge. And let's face it, a lot of folks with a lot of knowledge to fix this stuff aren't gung-ho to go work in the private sector anymore. Um, so that's my take on okay. things. Okay, um, so given that, I mean, it's it being a, a kind of a challenge, not just financially, but other resource-wise, staffing, time, people, um, what are you, your organizations, kind of doing and engaging with those parties? Who do we need to basically influence and address, you know, basically engage and address to, to start solving these? Uh, is it the state level officials? Is it federal? Is it, uh, you know, some of the companies that produce the software and hardware? Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, down the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about that? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, the, I think the thing that's not commonly understood or known is that you know because of states' rights, uh, elections, both state, local, and federal, are carried out under the state umbrella and not the federal one. So the ability to enact federal policy that that creates changes in this space is, is actually limited by that, and that's, you know, the reasons for that being the way it is are, are good. In this particular problem set, it's difficult because you can't cent centralise the solution. So the DHS has, has, has done the, the things that they've been able to do with, with the, uh, the Harbour Fund and putting resources out and saying, hey, like, we can't make you do stuff, but, like, if you do these things, here's some money that you can use to spend on that, which I think has been a, a, a good approach. Um, and really, you know, the, the, the thing that, uh, that, that we've been talking about with, with the states and, and the local folk, um, it's, okay, where are you up to in terms of adopting a, a vulnerable disclosure policy as a part of that? You know, do you have the ability to actually ingest what might be found and then take it and remediate it? And if you don't, what are the other solutions that might exist that can actually help accelerate that? Um, because you, you know, it, it, there's a huge spectrum of ca uh, capacity and cap capability with the people that are actually looking after this stuff. It ranges from very large, you know, entities to like the nephew of half the IT guy that works for a, a particular county. So, like, how do you cover as much of that as possible and, and create solutions that are available uh, depending on where they're up to? Mm -hmm. And yeah, on the front of vulnerability disclosure, the good news is that people are starting to yeah. take action. So we have both the state level for those who administer elections. They have begun stating their intentions to launch these vulnerability disclosure policies. So today, an uh, official from Colorado announced that he and several others are going to be launching vulnerability disclosure policies soon. So we can expect several states to start out first and then slowly more and more should follow as this becomes a standard practice. And I think really just once several start, others will see, hey, this isn't so bad. We're getting free vulnerability reports from friendly people who want to work with us to make us better. That's a pretty good deal. Um, so I, I think that's, that's promising. And then on the front of the election vendors, they are also getting together and starting these policies. So they have um, under the IT ISAC, so an ISAC is a strange, weird thing, um, an information sharing and analysis center um, where all the vendors get together and they discuss their practices. So they're considering starting vulnerability disclosure policies. So we're seeing across the board that they want to do better, both from vendors and states. And I think that actual process, um, actual stuff is happening, and we can we can hope to see those soon. Yeah, and we see this we see this curve like in every industry, right? When it comes yeah. to vulnerability disclosure, um, you know, young younger hackers in the room may not remember a time when when Microsoft was very not interested in hearing about uh, uh, vulnerability reports. And now they're very interested in hearing about vulnerability reports. But, you know, that's, that's old news. Thanks, Katie. Um, and uh, I, I do think that, for one, um, states and counties, you know, they are going to come. We're going to have to kind of drag them in kicking and streaming, screaming and streaming. Hey. Um, and uh, two, like we also, as, as the researcher reporting these things, we need to keep in mind like that these vulnerability reports are are emotional events yeah. right um, and so having some empathy uh, for the folks who are responsible for maintaining these systems is it will go a long long way um, you know I, I, I think it's it's unfair right now um, it's still unfair to say like well you should have known this right mm. um, so I would hope that uh, I can, I can use, use this soapbox that I'm sitting on right now. It is a soapbox, it's super uncomfortable. Um, to, awesome. to encourage people to, to be a little, like, maybe a little less combative. Not too much, like your bug, your choice. But, um, you know, when reporting vulnerabilities, uh, just to t take into account things like, you know, is it a Friday night? <laughs> is it right before a three-day weekend? Um, you know, things like that um, go a long, long way on, on helping get credibility. Uh, for future vulnerability reports and future, you know, vulnerability reporters like you. Kimber? Yeah. You're cool. Um, I just want to take a, a quick step back because we jumped right into this discussion making some assumptions that <laughs> folks in the room knew about um, elections in the big picture, like elections in capital E. So I just want to clarify that 
even though we talk about the 2020 election, which is an election everyone will be talking about, right? The president of the United States. The systems we're talking about, though, each state handles their own mm. voter registration. They roll their own systems for that. They are handling even the local municipalities are reporting up to the state. Uh, the state isn't always dictating what the local municipalities are doing or how they're handling their money or their systems. So when we, the, the focus here is on state, I'm just clarifying for folks in the room, because that's, that's where it's all happening. This, this um, landscape lives at the state level and it's not consistent across states. Um, it's not even consistent across counties. So I just wanted to kind of clarify. And I think we were talking about this for the prep was the voting machines are the only ones that are actually, you know, the patches and upgrades are certified by the FEC and that in itself is another process we'll talk about. But the, the e-poll books, uh, voter registration stuff, that is literally a roll your own type kind of thing. Each municipality kind of goes out and contracts with whatever vendor there is. So 50 states, how many counties, how many districts, that's how it is, so. And Casey, yeah. 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 Um, no, that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and the yeah, and the area of certification that's that's a challenge because yeah, if you talk to the vendors, um, yeah, so the EAC Election Assistance Commission certifies um, the voting machine vendors, um, and they provide voluntary certification that states can opt in to um, select vendors based on. And what's challenging with this is that. Even say if a vendor just has to patch a security vulnerability in their voting machine, the machine has to go through the whole certification process again. So in that sense, certification is both a positive because it does enforce certain controls, some of those are security related, but also can be really damaging to the process if a vendor can't get a patch out in time. So that's one of the major points of pain for um, voting machines themselves. And then, the, yeah, the other systems are kind of just the wild west. There's no certification. States can roll out whatever they want. And because of that, there's much less stringent controls around what can be enforced. Yeah. And, and that said about the, uh, the you know, AEC, because it, it, EAC rather, it's a difficult problem that they have to solve given the distribution of all the different What's variations EAC of things. What does EAC stand for? Hurting, hurting like an entire field of cats rather than just a couple in your house. And then trying to keep all the versions yeah. like tracked and all of those sorts of things. Um, they have received a funding increase uh, and they are doing work on what's, what's referred to as the de minimis change um, provision within you know, the requirements of certification for voting equipment. So the whole idea of you know, if you're missing a patch, um, you're not actually changing the things that they're meant to be certifying, which is the interface that's meant to keep the whole thing fair. Um, those sorts of things are being looked at, I believe, at the moment uh, to be able to allow that whole process to, to work a little bit more smoothly. Can I just chime in with a little ray of hope too? Because it wasn't that long ago, folks in the room, you, you have to know about like IoT healthcare devices and the problems we had with reporting vulnerabilities and then with having patches issued for medical devices. It was the same sort of thing. Getting something through FDA approval in under 18 months was impossible. And then by the time you got your patch approved, there were already like three more patches. And so you were still always behind. And FDA has made some improvements. So I just, I like to look at that as a framework for a way that we've shown that we can kind of learn and that, that we can help the government learn with us through responsible, uh, I hate the word responsible, um, coordinated <laughs> disclosure um, with <clears throat> medical devices. So if we can work to kind of tackle that same thing with this, we'd see maybe hopefully some of the same strides in patching faster. Yeah, and that, that kind of story is probably, is, was, it has, isn't anymore, but it was news, right, to, to folks that, that live in county IT. Um, you know, we, we heard a lot of um, caterwauling about like, well, we can't patch because EAC, which is the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, <laughs> and, and 
like we've, we've been down that road with medical devices and, and working with the FDA to like make sure that we could actually patch things in a timely manner. Which we is went the, food, down that the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you. Thank you, You're Casey. Yeah. <laughs> We're DC. Not everybody knows the acronym, uh, so yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, we went down that road with automotive, right? Yeah, like okay. the yeah. automotive manufacturers have a super long window for certifying, getting things certified and safety tested and all that. And we've been able to compress that kind of time with, with patching there. So yep. I don't, th this is not an intractable problem. Right, Absolutely. and and if if anyone gives you that excuse, say no, we can do this. Uh, you know, see si puede. So, so obviously, as you're mentioning here, this isn't just a solely technical approach. It's looking at like workflows and policy and and lots of people involved to kind of achieve the success. I mean, the kind of the things we've done with I am the Calvary, you know, create a branch there potentially for election committee uh, stuff or, and so forth. However, one of those cases is, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Kimber, about the fact that there is a ray of hope. So I'm kind of curious, you know, with your interactions individually or engagements with the companies, uh, essentially, like, who's really been, in your opinion, who's really been making some headway here? Like, who are the shining stars, the ones that basically say they got this, this is, you know, not necessarily best practice, but this is the kind of like rolling in the right direction. Is there any particular state method uh, that's been tried that you, you've had experience with success with? I'm, I'm a big fan of how Illinois is doing things, to call out like a good example. Um, Illinois has rolled out uh, the Cyber Navigator program, which sounds awesome and so Gibson-y. Um, and what that is is a giant chunk of money um, that they have earmarked specifically for building out um, you know, networking gear and also building up like the training and, and how to interface uh, with with other parts of the government, so they can so they can do things like run elections. Um, that's that was pretty much their mandate. I think it was great. It's expensive. <laughs> um, I don't think every state nor every county can do that. Um, but I am hopeful that uh, and 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 I was given hope this morning when we we met with the, the National Association of Secretaries of State or NAS. Um, <laughs> Uh, when, when I asked, it's like, hey, how many here have, have heard of or care about like the Cyber Navigator program? And, and hands went hands, up and lots, lots of nods. So I'm like, cool, you guys are doing it. Um, so that, that part has been really great for me. <laughs> I'll keep going. Oh, I was yeah, just, yeah, just wondering if anyone I'm, else on the panel, they're, they're deep in thought. It's yeah, amazing. trying to call out it's examples here. Um, yeah, so, so the state of Colorado on, on the issue of, of researcher rights, um, the interface between the security community and the overall election ecosystem, not just the voting machines, because it's not about just voting machines. Um, we should, should have worn t-shirts, but that's fine. Huh. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of work, not just to figure out their own position and how to sanely move forward with that type of thing, you know, as I said before, both for the sake of finding issues, but also for the sake of creating confidence in the vo voter base. They're actually doing a fair bit of work around educating other states, and you know, at this point, I think that side of, of the uh, the solution, everyone's kind of standing around the pool, um, saying, "Yeah, this seems like a good idea," but they're waiting for the first person to jump in. Um, and what Colorado is doing is, is trying to get a bunch of people to jump in at the same time to to kick that off, which I think is a, a really smart way of approaching it. And what it does is it allows people that are actually on the coal face and thinking about you know, the remediation, the response, the actual stuff that has to happen downstream of this, they can collaborate because they all share, you know, sets of issues that need to be considered as a part of that. I think with the, uh, the manufacturers uh, themselves, you know, there are some that are actually leaning forward and, and launching uh, disclosure programs. Um, you know, time will tell in terms of how they're doing with actually receiving the input from those and, and using it, uh, but the fact that they've signaled that and they're engaging with the community proactively, that conversation kind of got off on the wrong foot, yeah. um, and we've had to do a little bit of work to repair, I think, um, the trust that they have in, in the hacker community in general, but we're at a point now where that's starting to cross zero and, and get positive. So, oh, yeah, we're gonna leave. I was just gonna tag in about Colorado, because they're my favorite, <laughs> because they do mail-in ballots, which shuts all y'all down. Mm. But, but I also think it opens up for folks in rural areas to participate in ways that they wouldn't be able to participate otherwise. So mail-in ballots, that's what I like. Uh, on the flip side of that, West Virginia is experimenting with blockchain. And we're not gonna make any sounds here now. You can't from the make audience. them drink, that's too much liquor. You can't oh, oh, oh. do that, but 
Got to uh, be moonshine too. But you, but <laughs> but the West Virginia, Colorado contrast in the way that states are handling elections, like, should tell you everything you need to know about how states are rolling this out. Like they're making it up as they go, doing what they yeah. think will work best for their constituents. Yeah. So. Which yeah. is kind of the story of the internet, right? Like right. I'm not worried about that. It'll all work out in the end. Right. Also, there's no end. <laughs> and one other entity that's playing a, an increasingly supportive role in this is the organization CISA, the Cybersecurity yes. and Infrastructure Security Agency under the Department of Homeland Security. And they've ramped up their efforts since 2016 in response to all that happened in order to provide states with the support they need to better secure their infrastructure. So they offer, for instance, uh, free scanning and pen testing of these election systems. States just have to ask and they get that support for free. So CISA has been playing a large role in securing the actual infrastructure and yeah, another entity that is helping on this front. So we did the thought experiment while we're getting prepped here kind of uh, to kind of talk about a little bit of, you know, one of the reasons that Jack is here is he's had an experience trying to report a vulnerability up through one of the vendors. And I didn't know if you'd like to share a little bit of that process and, and what that provides as some of the challenges mm -hmm. going forward from here. Yeah, so the way I got into um, the, the area of election security was when I was registering to vote myself. I came across a vulnerability in my state's voter registration system, which was pretty bad. It was a SQL injection flaw. Um, and the process of actually going to disclose that to the state was a lengthy one. It took about six months to actually find the right person to disclose it to and get it so they could fix it. And that was kind of my introduction to seeing where vulnerability disclosure can go wrong. And seeing that, it wasn't necessarily the fact that there was no one I could talk to. It was just that I didn't know who to reach out to. And to the average person who stumbles across a vulnerability in one of these systems, it's not clear that you have to go, say, to a certain entity that actually manages the elections rather than just the state government um, or whatever to someone just from the outside. So I think that's a major point of having vulnerability disclosure policy is making it as accessible as possible for someone who's from the outside, doesn't know anything about how government works, what the EAC says uh, all these crazy acronyms are and they're able to disclose the vulnerability and get to the person who can fix it so yeah I think that that's a major point why we really need these policies because otherwise people just aren't going to know what to do with these it's inevitable that people are going to find vulnerabilities and they need a way to be able to quickly tell someone about it so shifting gears a little bit um, um, you know, we're talking, we, we mentioned about like this disinformation campaign, some of those soft threats uh, earlier on here. Um, generally, you know, for seemingly non-technical threats such as disinformation spread through various means, Facebook, social media, your parent reads a newspaper written by a really awful author, um, what are better approaches to attacking these soft vulnerabilities? Uh, either addressing them through, you know, word of mouth to basically use the spread of intelligent folks to go and try to combat that there? Uh, or do they require new approaches? Are these things that we haven't really thought about because we've just been exasperated? Mm -hmm. And you know, are there ways we can tackle them now or are we just gonna give up? You know, is, there, is, there, is there a chance to do something within, between the primaries and the next election? Or is it something we're just gonna have to throw in the backlog? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, um, <clears throat> the biggest antidote to that is, is really to dilute the impact of misinformation by actually going out and voting in the first place and, and for as many people uh, to, to do that who, you know, intend to do that, um, to go and get it done um, and regardless of the wacky stuff that might happen on, on the internet and in the news around it, um, basically don't let anything prevent you from completing that. Even down to, you know, Jack raised uh, the, the threat model of someone monkeying with the voter registration systems, like if you rock up and you're an American citizen, you can cast a provisional ballot so there are, there are escape routes even if there is actual interference that, that's identifiable on the day. So I think that's, that's the big one. Um, I think the, the issue of the suspension of disbelief that we all seem to have kind of grown accustomed to in terms of where we get our news from collectively. Um, it's, it's interesting, I, you know, Facebook have come out and, and talked about uh, some of the, you know, the privacy day stuff and, and being able to disconnect different things and, and actually try to educate to some degree um, people on like where their information's going. I don't 
I mean, honestly, the, the, the platforms that are doing this stuff don't actually really have an incentive to solve this problem because the more you know, polarizing content there is on their platforms, the longer people are gonna have their eyeballs on there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the whole reason they're there. So yeah, I kind of like the idea of turning the internet, internet up to like stupid for a little period of time and see if we can get the frog to jump out of the pot and, and people to actually re-engage critical thinking. That's like my <laughs> off the cuff solution for this one, but it's not a great one. Thank you, Bernie, I did on this. Um, so I think for sure, go vote. <laughs> Right, no matter what, go vote. I, I think that's the central message uh, for us here. Yeah. That's our so message. Um, I don't care who you vote for, just, just go vote. Do it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we can do as researchers, when you're, some of you have probably participated in interviews with reporters, um, if you, they're gonna ask questions meant to like get clicks, right? They're looking for the hot, you know, <clears throat> oh, the state was hacked and the state didn't know for three weeks because nobody at state level had clearance to receive the vulnerability, that happened. Um, so if you can kind of think of it in the way you do improv and just add the yes and, right? Well, yes and we've worked really hard to remediate those vulnerabilities or here's what we're looking at in the future or yes, the voting machine fell in two minutes but this voting machine actually isn't in service and kind of correct some of the misinformation that's getting put out there that's, that's really just meant to incite fear and get clicks and don't be part of that system. Um, you know, the market's flooded with bad information. So if we can flood it with like truthful information, good or bad, but let's be truthful, um, but never, never deter folks from voting as you're, putting out your message, um, so that's my soapbox. And we, you know, a bunch of us here and some of the folks out in the audience participated at Hackers on the Hill on Thursday. We had a chance to, to talk to some legislator, uh, legislators and their, their staff. Uh, I know for at least for the ones that we went with, uh, you know, they, they had election security as, as part of those topics. Are there other folks, are there, how, how would we engage the campaigns? Like, you know, they're on TV all the time, they're buying ad time, they're, they're in front of people, they're going out in primary, or, Oh, I Iowa, I guess, come Monday. Uh, you know, if you have time in front of them, what's the, the thing you would tell them to do? Maybe, you know, at, since they have a, a bully pulpit in a way to help out this. None? I talked last time. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, if we're thinking about um, what campaigns can do, there's a, a clear first step is to think about security. It's concerning that zero of the campaigns have a CISO at all, so who's gonna be securing these systems that play an increasingly important role and we know are being t actively targeted by foreign actors trying to influence our elections? So I think that like that's a clear step. We need to be thinking about it. If they're not thinking about it, then it's hard to imagine that they're doing security very well. So on one end, we need to make sure that campaigns themselves are secure. The other end of that is making sure that campaigns commit to following certain practices, for instance, not um, disseminating disinformation that they're aware of, or um, for instance, after an election ends, claiming that was interfered in, in order to say maybe that the election wasn't legitimate. So I think that campaigns need to commit to be as open as possible, not to spread false information about the security of these elections. We've seen in some smaller state elections, such as in Georgia, that this has led to elected officials or those who didn't win elections casting doubt on these elections. So that, that's really the role, to secure their own systems and then to ensure that even if they don't win, they're not criticizing the security of our election systems. Yeah, plus one. Um, the, the, the purpose of elections is to convince losers that they lost. And if, they, and if a candidate, like, if support, supporters are going to go on, on Twitter and be dumb, right? Um, and, and, and even do have that. winners that will complain that they lost even though they won. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> um, but, like, when a candidate does that, right, like, that is super damaging. That is, that is 
anti-democratic. Um, you know, like we live, we currently live in, a, in an environment where we are announcing winners and losers uh, on election night, you know, weeks before the vote has been certified, with some exceptions, asterisk 2000. Um, you know, usually the candidates um, will make their concession speeches, and it's that it, that is their opportunity to like show grace and humility, and you know, better luck next time, buddy. Um, you know, and and I'm I'm hopeful that in the uh, coming elections, primaries, and and general alike, uh, the the losers of those um, elections are are you know take the loss, and and try, please don't blame the cybers, because uh, that's that's not helpful for anyone. So. You know, we're getting closer to the end here, but it, this is the kind of the stage where y you're up here and this is the call to action to everybody here. So my question the, to the panel here as we start to wrap up, what are things that the average human being here with some skills and maybe not, you know, go back and tell mom and dad while you're doing tech support on them, what is the message that they can kind of carry out either to perform as an individual or the message that they can, this group of people can actually go and do? I'll go again. Yeah. Um, I, I think that if you, so people in this room are, are some of the most likely people to find vulnerabilities in systems that are election and election adjacent, right? So like voter registration, you know, county websites uh, that, that tell poll, polling locations, um, you know, things like that. If you happen to find vulnerabilities, don't be frustrated. Um, you will probably have a little bit of trouble finding the right person to talk to, right, Jack? Um, but if you do run into that, like, reach out to, uh, to CISA. I mean, that would be my, my like, that's, for today, um, I think that's probably the best clearinghouse for this kind of stuff. Election infrastructure is critical infrastructure. It is in their mandate to deal with. Um, CISA uh, at, at Department of Homeland Security ha is very researcher forward. Um, they, they love us, guys, they really do, it's weird. I know, like, they're from the government, they're here to help, kind of rings hollow. Um, but for them, in my experience at least, um, and I've, I've been around a couple blocks on, on vulnerability disclosure, they are more than willing to help um, and, and at least listen to you. So if you run into problems reporting vulns, like, go to them. Yeah, I would definitely echo the sentiments on vulnerability disclosure. I would say that even as a first step, if you find a vulnerability, just try contacting, say, the Board of Elections or whoever it is that hosts that, and most of the time they're receptive and they want to do better. And then, yeah, CISA is a great fallback. And I would say that, second, the key thing to keep in mind is that elections are a multi-layered system, and there are fallbacks for when stuff goes wrong. Yes. So if say, for instance, a voting machine breaks down or there's ransomware on it, there's paper ballots. If someone tries interfering with that, most states now um, will, one, use um, voting machines that make paper ballots, and two, they perform some type of audit audits. Many more are now performing risk-limiting audits. And like Casey said before, for instance, if a voter a registration site is compromised and someone changes all the records, you have a right um, guaranteed by law to cast a provisional ballot, and that cannot be interfered with if a voter registration database is changed. So there are these fallbacks that, in the worst case scenario, we can still vote, we can still be confident that our elections worked as trusted. So because of that, I think the key thing to keep in mind, which is what we've been saying this whole panel, is that yes, there are vulnerabilities, yes, our elections are going to be targeted, but the key target is people's perceptions of the elections and not the elections themselves. So keeping that in mind when we talk about these, when we talk about voting systems, when we talk about vulnerabilities, we clearly need to be doing research, we need to help better secure them, but we always should come around with the caveat that it's not going to be the end of the world. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the, the role, because the role that you know, probably everyone in this room plays in, in their family and in their peer group is just that you're the, you're the critical nerd um, who, you know, if, if there's something wrong with something, you'll be the person in the group that speaks up about it. Um, which makes it really powerful when you understand some of those things that actually exist as backstops to preserve the integrity of the process and, and use that as your own opinion, if you, if you buy into it, obviously, um, but hopefully you do, um, that you should still go and vote. 
uh, even if you know things get weird on social media or you start reading things that are funny or whatever else. You know, I, I, I think it's a it's a personal decision in terms of your own conviction on the subject. Um, but I think the, the 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 role that the security community can play specifically for 2020 is to like use the network effect that's available in a, a group this size to actually educate others that yeah no you know what um, this has been like the the most important thing that we can do is to actually show up. Kimber. Um, <clears throat> So this is where I'll get on my community soapbox and say, when you go to vote, most of the folks in the, in the place where you go vote are volunteers. Mm -hmm. That means there are volunteer opportunities like right now in your local communities to, to go help with that like poll workers system. And stuff, yeah. Right, yes, help the poll workers or you know, there are a, a slew of other things that happen um, at the places that you go vote. Um, and then second to that is like campaigns. I know that none of us have a whole ton of extra time on our hands, but if you really want to help your local candidate, volunteer for their campaign and like tune them up. Hmm. <laughs> now, now, Mick. But you know, that, but that's the thing, like particularly local governments, those folks are, are running for office on their own dimes. Um, and they're like just boots on the ground with more volunteers. This is not a thing that we can just fix with code. I wish we could, but this is gonna take a movement of people actually giving a shit about security in your local community, your state, yeah. and then at the federal level. And I mean, you're gonna have to like stop bitching about how broken it is and like go help fix it. So that's the thing. That's I mean, you know, as part of a call to action, most of us are probably, or some of us are going to Hacker Summer Camp. You got some time? If you see any of us who are gonna be there, come back and give us a report card. I wanna know, we wanna know what you've done. We've given you the tools, we've given you the information. You know, I, I think one of the, the talks yesterday, uh, you know, Bruce was talking about the, 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 his call to action. There's just some people that will be, uh, go and do it. But this is important for our democracy. This is important for our country, this is important for your family, your loved ones, your friends. So, you know, go from here, grab a drink, and go, what the hell can I do? So that's me trying to address the panel here and the crowd, but I, I think we've got a lot of tools here to go forward. So, you know, one of the, the things is here, we've got a little bit of time left. I don't want to necessarily take questions. We'll go to the bar while they're setting things up here. Um, but, uh, you know, anyone from Cincinnati is kind of used to Jerry Springer, so he always had a closing statement. So I want to at least also let any folks here just kind of not necessarily stick to the script, but if you've got about four minutes to kind of rapid fire, like, what are you going to do personally with this knowledge now? Make it as easy as possible uh, to formulate policy um, that allows for you know any uh, organization of any size, like federal down to the local level, to instantiate a sane vulnerability disclosure policy, um, and then to be able to you know assist them with wherever they're up to in terms of their ability to actually do that, um, help them get to the next step. So uh, this morning, I actually, I was at the NAS meeting also and um, have offered to volunteer my time with a couple different Secretary of State offices to help roll out some, some bare bones VDP policies with very limited scope, so don't get excited. There's no bounties, sorry, Casey. <laughs> um, but, but just to, to help them start to think about ways to, to help people report vulnerabilities to their states. Jack or Todd? Likewise, yeah, I'm um, planning on helping yeah, both states and vendors in starting vulnerability disclosure policies. Um, then personally, I'm also in talks to work with CISA on these election issues in order to um, address kind of some of these technical flaws at scale. Uh, in, my, in my local community, I am a poll uh, volunteer, a poll worker volunteer. It is. Uh, it is like a 16 hour day and it's super fun and it's crazy and if you're you know, a little bit extroverted, it help, goes a long way. Um, that's, that's super fun like, and I love talking to people about voter security while they're standing in line to vote because I'm in the position to well actually them. So uh, it's, it's, it's very gratifying. <laughs> 
All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, our esteemed panel, Kimber, Casey, Todd, and um, um, that. Jeez, I just blew that one. But anyhow. Jack. Jack. Yes. Long day. I've got a tattoo. Fresh. I'm in pain. So you see me like doing yeah, this it's up super here. super badass, yeah. too. It, I did it on a dare. But anyhow, thank you for coming. Best tattoos are dare Go tattoos. Go out and vote. Go out and help your community. And thank you for coming to ShmooCon on the panel.